Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this video, I'd like to address a rather subtle point that I've carefully avoided in this playlist up until now. And that's the difference between the notion of an affine variety and an affine scheme. The notion of a scheme in algebraic geometry was introduced by Grotentieck. Uh, he is uh, one of the great figures of 20th century mathematics and arguably the founder of modern algebraic geometry. And when he introduced the notion of a scheme in algebraic geometry, it caused quite a scandal. Okay, so let me motivate this by talking about the following rather weird phenomenon that you will see. So let's suppose we're looking inside the affine line, and I want to look at the following varieties. The variety carved out by x equals 0, and the variety carved out by x squared equals 0. So of course, if x equals 0, you just have this point here, where x equals 0. But if you look at the set of points where x squared equals 0, you also get just this one point where x equals 0. Now we talked about the notion of a coordinate ring which captures this information, this geometry here. And what you see is now the following question arises. Is the coordinate ring of this single point here, the quotient of this polynomial ring, by the ideal generated by x? So what's this quotient ring? It's of course just isomorphic to the field f that you started with. Or is the coordinate ring the following quotient ring? The polynomial ring f of x modulo the ideal generated by x squared. And if you look at this ring here, it's very different. So what's the difference here? This ring here is not a field. And the easiest way to see that is to look at the following element, which is the coset containing x, x plus the ideal x squared. This is what's called nilpotent. And that's because when you square it, you'll get inside this ideal here, so it's zero. So you have a non-zero element whose square is equal to zero. So this is not a field. So the question arises, of course, what's the correct choice for what the coordinate ring of this point is? Well, in this case, the answer is fairly easy. Okay. The reason why it's easy is because a single point, you can also think of affine space, where you have a to the 0. And if you have a to the 0, we see that the corresponding coordinate ring should be just f to the 0 polynomials, uh, variables. So you just have the field f there. So this is the correct one, and this is the incorrect one. But we should see precisely why that's the case. And to see more generally how we should think of this example in the general context, algebraic geometry, we need to introduce some new definitions. Okay, so let's look fairly generally at some commutative ring R and consider an ideal inside that ring R. Okay, so what's going on here? So the first thing I want to define is the notion of reduced. Okay, so what does reduced mean? It means that if you have any element inside your ring, which is nilpotent, so what's that mean? It just means some high enough power of that element is equal to zero. Then that element has to be zero itself. So an example of something which is not reduced is this ring here. Okay, You have a nilpotent element. Okay, Its square is zero, but it itself is not zero. Okay, so that's the first thing to note. And that's the first definition. The next definition is concerning the ideal i. We say an ideal is radical if the corresponding quotient, r mod i, is reduced. So in this example here, the ideal generated by x squared inside this polynomial ring is not radical. OK, the third definition I want to give is the notion of, given an ideal i, what is the radical of that ideal? So that's going to be the following set of elements of r. 
And you can show that this set of elements of R is actually an ideal, and a radical ideal, and hence the name. Okay, let's go through the definition slowly. You just look at all the elements inside your ring, such that some high enough power of that element is inside your ideal. Okay. So that's called the radical of that ideal I, and it's denoted with this symbol here. So one of the simple facts you can check from the definition is that it contains the original ideal I. So why is that true? Well, let's check that every element here is inside here. If you pick an element inside your ideal R, then we need to show that some power of it is inside the ideal. And of course, we just need to take n equals 1 for that to be true. So that tells you that this radical of this ideal I contains the original ideal I. OK, so something that you should see is that for a field, we know this is reduced. And the reason for that is that it's a domain, and so there are no nilpotent elements other than the zero. So this concept of reduced distinguishes between these two rings. This one's reduced, but this one isn't. So I want to say, in some sense, this one's the better choice for that reason. OK, so let's look a little bit at this notion of the radical of an ideal. This is quite a new thing. Let's look at this example here, where we take the ideal generated by x squared, and we look at the radical of that. Well, of course, it should include x. So it's when you square this, it lands inside there. So it has to be an ideal containing x. And of course, in this case, it's just equal to the ideal generated by x. So this is an example where the radical of an ideal, it does get strictly bigger. And in fact, it goes to this one here. And that tells you also the relationship between these two examples. If you go from here to here, I take the radical of this ideal, and I get this one here. OK. Well, what happens if you start it with a radical ideal, and you take the radical of that ideal? Well, it turns out that in this case, this is the precisely the time when the ideal doesn't get any bigger. OK. So we can now put our weird phenomenon that we observed before into the general context and also show how to resolve this in the best possible way. And that's via Hilbert's Nullstellensatz, which we saw earlier in this playlist. So what was the strange thing that we saw? Well, remember, given any ideal of the polynomial ring, I, you can map it over to some closed subset of affine n space. And that we denoted B of i, which is essentially just a set of zeros of all the polynomials in i. And what we saw in our first example is that you can have different ideals, in that case, the ideal generated by x and the ideal generated by x squared, and they both map to the same thing over here. So what does Hilbert's Nullstellensatz tell? Well, let's suppose you don't look at all the ideals inside here, but you only look at the ones which are radical. But if you look at just the set of radical ideals here, you can restrict this map to this set here, and then you'll find that you actually get a bijection between these two things. So that's the first thing that's rather interesting, is now you have a classification of all these closed subsets that's very precise. You just have to look at all the radical ideals of this polynomial ring. So if this is a bijection, that means that you can also talk about the inverse of this here. So given any closed subset of affine n space, you can work out a corresponding radical ideal such that that closed subset is the variety corresponding to that radical ideal. And what's the formula for it here? Okay, so suppose we have a closed subset like B of i, 
and we allow this i to be any ideal here, and we want to work out the corresponding radical ideal. Well, it should be something that depends just on this set here. And it's going to be a set of polynomials. And which polynomials are they? Well, it's just going to be the set of all the polynomials which have value 0 on all the points inside this closed subset B of i. So this depends just on this set here, not on the i. Of course, the other question is, what's the relationship between this ideal, this radical ideal, and the original ideal i that you used here. Well, that's given by the notion of the radical of this ideal. So this allows us to answer the question that we saw at the beginning. How do we work out the coordinate ring of a variety? And the answer is as follows. If you're given a closed subset of affine n space, so v equals some v of i, you can define its coordinate ring, denoted by this symbol here, to be the quotient of the polynomial ring by the radical ideal, which is just the radical of i. So basically, what types of coordinate rings can you get? These are all reduced quotients of polynomial rings. And such rings are called affine f-algebras. And the terminology comes from the fact that, of course, these correspond to affine varieties. OK, so let's recap. Hilfer's Neustellensatz says that if you consider coordinate rings of varieties, you need to look at reduced quotients of the polynomial ring. Grotenick actually wanted to generalize this setup. And his generalization was based on the following belief, which he gave precise mathematical meaning to. So he thought that any commutative ring is actually the co coordinate ring of some sort of geometric object. Of course, if this commutative ring happens to be a, an affine f-algebra, then you get some sort of affine variety. But he believed that if it's some other sort of commutative ring, it still corresponds to something geometric. And the way he did that to a certain extent, is by fiat. He just decided, well, what is an affine scheme? Well, the data that's involved is just the commutative ring. But when we think of this commutative ring in a geometric way, we'll call it spec R, the spectrum of a half. OK, so in what sense can this object, this commutative ring, be a geometric thing? Well, the point is that if you want to extract geometry, from it, you have to try to rewrite all your geometric concepts in terms of the algebra. And remember, one of the things that we saw in Hilbert's Neustellensatz is that the points of an affine variety just correspond to the maximal ideals. And the concept of a maximal ideal makes sense in any commutative ring, not just affine f-algebras. So one of the things that you might want to try to do is to consider the set of points of this just to be the set of all maximal ideals. And that's an important object in its own right, but it's not Grotendieck's definition. He decided to go a little bit more general and throw in some extra points. And he considered all prime ideals. So remember, this ideal is prime if the quotient R mod P is a domain. And this will also be maximal in in fact, the quotient is a field. So this is a slight generalization of the situation that appears over in the case of affine varieties. So there are a few more points that you have to consider. And that's just because of the way he set things up. OK, so you've got at least a set of points if you consider any commutative ring. And you can ask, well, is there at least a topological space? And the answer is yes. You can do the same sort of thing. And you go back to the situation of affine varieties, and you look for inspiration there. OK? And what you do now is you look at all ideals i of your ring, and each of one of these will give you a closed set. 
So it's going to be a set of points, so prime ideals inside R. And which prime ideals do you consider? They're the ones which happen to contain this ideal. So this is the one that's suggested from the theory of Offline Variety. Okay, and then you can ask other things. Well, suppose you wanted to see some more geometry. Can you ask, for example, about the tangent bundle on here? Then you have to think, well, can I characterize the tangent bundle purely in terms of the commutative ring R? And if you can, then you can do that. So the data that's involved in this affine scheme is just the commutative ring. And if you want to extract geometry, you have to interpret it in the right way by looking at things like this. Okay, so let's see some examples to give you a little bit of a feel of what this object looks like. So the first ring that's quite a departure from affine F algebras is to consider the simplest ring, just the integers. And you can ask, well, what's the spectrum of that? What's that affine scheme? Well, remember, what's the set of points? The set of points is just the prime ideals of Z, and they're very easy to enumerate. Of course, for each prime integer, you get a prime ideal that's generated by it, so 2, 3, 5, and so forth. And these are also actually maximal ideals. Okay. You have one extra prime, and that's the one corresponding to, to zero. Okay. Z itself is a domain, so if you pick the ideal zero, Z mod zero is still a domain, so this is prime. Okay, and they're all the prime ideals that you have. What's special about these maximal ones? Okay, well, one way to think about the maximal ideals is topologically, they're the closed points. Okay, so why is that true? I think the easiest way to see why that's true is to see why this zero is not closed. So if this were to be a closed point, right? That must be the set of just that element there must have this form. Okay? So the element that you have in there is zero. So we have to pick the i. So this zero has to contain some ideal which is zero. So that must be b of zero. And of course, which prime ideals contain zero? All of them. So it turns out that the closure of this point is actually the whole of this spectrum here, this whole thing. So this is not closed, but applying a similar argument shows that each of these maximal ideals are actually closed. So one of the nice things about Groshendieck's generalization is that you can look at the integers and try to think about that geometrically and use geometric understanding to try to study it. Okay, so let's look at another example which is not an affine F algebra. And that's the one that we saw at the beginning of this video. F of x modulo x squared. You can again look at the corresponding topological space and look at all the points in here. And here the only maximal ideal again is just the one generated by x. So there's just a single point in this space. So topologically, it's just a point. And that's the same for the corresponding variety where x equals 0. It's just a point. But this ring is quite different now, as we saw. And in some sense, it's bigger than the coordinate ring of a point, which is just f. For example, its dimension over f is two-dimensional. So it's a bit bigger. So it contains more information. So it turns out that the topology that I've written here, it doesn't capture all the geometry that's floating around in this affine scheme. It's the commutative ring that has all that extra information. So the data that's involved is just the commutative ring itself. Okay, so if you want to know actually what's that extra information that it contains, well it turns out that this is related to looking at tangent space information, information about tangent vectors. And to understand how that's true, you'll have to look at another video. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.